things, but I'd like to kick off today's session with uh, the panel Reconsidering Museums and Their Collections in a Post-Colonial World. This panel will be moderated by Vibha Joshi, who's research affiliate at the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography at the University of Oxford. She'll be joined by three panelists, Hor El Kasimi, Nancy Rossoff, and Sarah Suzuki, who will each be giving 10 minute PowerPoint presentations, followed by a 45 minute moderated discussion. And at the close of that discussion, we'll have about 10 minutes uh, for audience questions. Um, so if you do have questions, please submit them in the Q&A tab at any point, either during their presentations or the discussion. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator, Vibha Joshi. Vibha, thank you. Hi. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm Vibha Joshi, and I'm from University of Oxford at the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography. Uh, I would like to invite our first speaker and just to kind of repeat what Michelle already said, all the speakers will speak for 10 minutes each. And after that, there'll be a 45 minute moderated discussion followed by 10 minutes of Q&A uh, from the audience. So our first speaker is Hul al Kasi, President and Director, Sharjah Art Foundation. Thank you, Vipa. Um, yes, uh, Horal Kasimi from Sharjah Art Foundation. I'd like to thank Michelle for the invitation. Um, I've prepared a very quick, uh, uh, I was told to have five slides, so I'll try to limit uh, my talk to these five slides as examples. Um, the first slide I, I wanted to talk about is an important project that has part, been part of the artists um, um, our commitment to artists within Sharjah Art Foundation, we're known to work with artists for long periods of time, uh, sometimes um, at the beginning of the career, middle, end. And so an example I wanted to include was a project by Camp. If I can have the first slide. Um, Camp started uh, with us in um, 2009 with a project called Warfage. Um, Warfage was a project that was uh, that took part on the creek in Sharjah, right behind the office where I am right now. Um, and it's uh, they work, they collaborated with the sailors on the large number of ships that leave for ports in Somalia. Um, I think it's really important when you uh, work as an institution to look at your regional context um, and its history, its community. Um, so always questioning uh, what our region is, not only by geographic location, but the people that inhabit it uh, as well, and language. So the project uh, Warfage actually took uh, had two parallel pieces. One was a book that contained two years of port records related to the Somali trade, and Radio Mina, which was uh, four evenings of radio transmissions from the port in Sharjah, which uh, broadcast in a five plus kilometer radius songs, commentary, phone and ship radio conversations with ships in Salaya, in Bosasu and en route, accounts from Gujarati sailors, loaders from the Darakazi Khan and NWFP in Pakistan, Sikh truckers, Iranian shopkeepers, Somali trading agents, all of whom spoke Hindustani, which is Hindu and Urdu, as a common language of the port. So I think for us, the, our projects are really rooted in um, working and collaborating with, with people in, in the areas that we work on. From that came a new project uh, that uh, the collective, the art collective from India, CAMP, um, were working on, and they submitted to our production program, uh, which um, they received the grant for this work called From Gulf to Gulf to Gulf, and it premiered at Documenta in 2012. Um, and as I said, that's a collaboration, collaboration between camp and a group of sailors from Kutch district of Western India. And uh, the sailors recorded their journeys um, through um, their journeys through this, um, the seas from Gulf to Gulf to Gulf. And that was transmitted and shown again in Sharjah uh, for the 11th biennial, which was curated by Yuko Hasegawa. But it was shown exactly near where if you could see the pictures on the right, that was from Gulf to Gulf to Gulf. On the left was Warfage. 
on my right. I don't know where that is for you. Um, but you could see that just across from where they are sitting is the actual port. So every night you had the sailors and their friends waiting for this film to start, um, which was very special. Um, the next slide, I have to keep it short, <laughs> is Rashid Arayin. I chose his exhibition as an example because the story is, for me, very special. Um, Rashid um, came to my office or um, and left. Somebody said Rashid left something for you in your office, and I saw him again at the art fair in Dubai. And uh, he said to me, um, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And I said, of course, I know who you are. And he said, I, um, I want to work on a conference on Islam and culture. And I immediately said, no, I would prefer to do an exhibition on your work. And he said, well, nobody's given me an exhibition on my work, a solo exhibition. Um, and it was really interesting that he felt that I mean, a lot of people knew Rashid, they knew some of his work, but I felt that I hadn't seen enough. You know, I didn't think he got the recognition that he deserved with the history of what he worked on in London with Black Phoenix and um, working as a performance artist. So we worked together on this exhibition called Before and After Minimalism, which he wanted to show because it was the first time he showed his early works from Pakistan alongside his newer work and work in between. So in the back, you could see that yellow disc uh, with pictures that was a prototype for an invention called disco sailing, where someone would go into the water and balance. Uh, and the other one is a, a performance of these red circles that you would throw into the water called chakras. Um, so since then, Rashid has uh, grown on to have many exhibitions and be in major collections. So that was uh, uh, I was, you know, that was uh, really special for us. And the next slide. Uh, I included, um, instead of an exhibition, a picture of the exhibition, I included the, a still <laughs> from O Horizon. We currently have an ex a very large exhibition by the Autolith Group that was curated by Annie Fletcher uh, that started in Van Abbe Museum. Um, it will go on to uh, Ima in Ireland, where she's director right now. Um, so for us, I chose this slide because we actually showed this work in the Sharjah Architecture Triennial as well. And I think there's something special about um, this work, looking at the research and interest in, in Tagore. And it really resonates with a lot of the communities and people uh, that are in Sharjah. And since the exhibition was on at the moment, I thought it would be important to to mention that. And the last slide, and I have two more slides, sorry. The next slide uh, is Herer Sarkisian, another artist who we worked on, for, uh, worked with for many years. Um, this is an older work, Execution Squares, that he showed in Sharjah um, very early on, but it's also part of a new exhibition uh, called The Other Side of Silence that's curated by my colleague Omar Khalaif. Um, this project was also really important to people in our communities here, especially a lot of Syrian refugees who understand the work around uh, Herrera talking about the politics of Syria, uh, Armenia, the Armenian genocide. Um, he um, was looking back at his father's uh, photographic studio, which was the only photographic color photo studio um, in uh, Syria at the time. Um, so this is, these are the two exhibitions that are on at the moment at the foundation. And the last image that I put is Zarina Bimji, Lead White, which was an exhibition that we had, um, we started for March, 20, whenever the pandemic hit, and we opened it just uh, after lockdown. Um, but it was a really important exhibition. Um, this is a, a commission that we worked on for the Tate, Mod uh, Tate Britain installation. And what's really great about Zarina's work is that she's been researching a lot of archives uh, in Britain and Zanzibar and looking at the colonial history and, um, and colonial history of Britain and others in the continent of Africa. So I, I chose these um, artwork, artwork specifically or artists 
because I wanted to explain that our mission at the Shraja Art Foundation is really to talk about our, our common histories. Of course, the uh, colonial histories are, is very strong. We're looking at artists in war-torn regions like Syria, uh, looking at um, um, working with people within communities. Um, I didn't really um, cater or, or, or um, mold this conversation and to talk about collections per se. Uh, the collection kind of comes out um, after working with, with the artists and deciding what makes sense. We are um, building a building for our collection since it's grown, but it was important that it's a um, that it's close to the university so that it's also a, a collection that's used not only by visitors, but that is accessible to students on foot. Um, yeah, so I think I, I managed to wrap everything in 10 minutes, <laughs> I hope. Thank you, Hoor. And we'll, um, that was very interesting to know what kind of exhibitions. And uh, later on in question and answer, we will, and the discussion, we'll talk about what are the criteria for actually selecting exhibitions and deciding on the topic. Uh, I would like to now invite Nancy Rosoff. Um, she's Andrew W. Mellon, Senior Curator, Arts of the Americas at Brooklyn Museum, New York. Hi, Nancy. Yeah. Greetings. Greetings, everyone from Queens, New York. Um, thank you, Michelle, for the invitation and Sarah for all your help. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that my home and the Brooklyn Museum stand on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, I recognize and honor the Lenape Delaware nations their elders past and present and future generations. At the Brooklyn Museum, we are committed to addressing exclusions and erasures of indigenous people and confronting the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in our work. In the following presentation, I will describe three projects that utilize the Brooklyn Museum's collection to address the topics of climate change and the dispossession of indigenous homelands. Climate in Crisis, Environmental Change in the Indigenous Americas, which runs until July 3rd, 2022, was curated by myself with assistance from Joseph Shakowitz and Shea Spiller, curatorial assistants in the Arts of the Americas and Europe Division. The urgency to develop this exhibition grew out of the relentless news in 2019 of the raging deliberately set forest fires in Brazil the impact of global warming on Arctic sea ice and the Trump administration's assault on Native American sovereignty and ancestral homelands. As Steve Lyons and Kai Bosworth note, emergencies provide openings for museums to become activist institutions. Indeed, we felt immediate action was necessary. However, however the authors also acknowledge Rapid responses pose challenges to institutions with fixed budgets and five or 10 year plans. Climate in crisis was organized in five months with a modest budget, which meant some adjustments to our typical planning. For instance, display cases, existing display cases were used, which of course is not a bad thing as it is more environmentally friendly and the collapsed time frame and small budget meant that appropriate native consultations were not possible. Instead, we foregrounded Indigenous voices in the section panels by including published statements made by Indigenous community activists. The living artists featured in the show were also interviewed to get their perspectives on the climate crisis for inclusion in exhibition labels. The main thesis of the exhibition is that the current climate emergency is part of a longer history of environmental colonialism that began 500 years ago. For millennia, indigenous communities throughout the Americas have maintained profound and expansive relationships with the natural world. However, beginning in the 1500s, Europe's conquest and colonization of the Americas forced ways of using natural resources that clashed with traditional indigenous modes of relating to the world. This fundamental difference in worldview between one that sees human beings, animals, plants, and the land as interrelated and co-equal 
and another that privileges human needs above everything else has resulted in ever escalating threats to indigenous homelands, ways of life and survival, as well as the unprecedented level of climate change affecting the planet today. The exhibition is divided into seven regional groupings and countries spanning North, Central and South America. This framework is complicated because it disregards the spread of myriad cultures across continents before nation states even existed. However, by grouping the works by country, the exhibition underscores the geopolitical nature of any attempt to combat the climate crisis today. Each section provides a history of indigenous occupation, spotlights a current environmental issue, and illustrates how indigenous activists are resisting and counteracting these problems. Next slide, please, Vanessa. The works on view connect to the environment in one or two ways. Many reveal indigenous understandings of the world as they relate to natural resources, cultural practices, and spiritual beliefs, while others more directly address the threat of climate change to indigenous livelihoods. For example, the Canadian and U.S. Arctic section includes Inuit and Alaska Native soapstone carvings and engraved whale tooth and works on paper to illustrate the continued importance of hunting in the Arctic region and the interrelationship between animal and spirit worlds. Meanwhile, a contemporary 16 millimeter film basket by Onondaga Micmac artist Gail Tremblay entitled When Ice Stretched On for Miles references the effects of global warming on Arctic sea ice, while also challenging us to confront the misrepresentation and destruction of indigenous cultures and homelands. Today, Arctic temperatures are rising twice as fast as the global average. And in the past three decades alone, multi-year ice has declined by 95%, shifting animals' migration patterns, devastating the region's biodiversity and creating dangerous conditions that threaten the very existence of the ice and those who live on it. Next slide, please. The second project centers around the development of a land acknowledgement statement, which you heard at the beginning of the presentation. This statement, which was developed in collaboration with Lenape Delaware representatives and recognizes that they have been dispossessed from their ancestral homeland, is posted at the museum's entrance and on our website. Joe Baker, an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians and co-founder and co-director of the Lenape Center in New York, rightly pointed out that such statements were beginning to feel tokenistic, that institutions were simply checking off a box without considering how recognition can be relevant and meaningful to Lenape communities today. And Professor Spivak alluded to this issue in her keynote. Baker's insight prompted us to consider other ways that we could meaningfully engage with Lenape communities. In October 2019, the museum organized a two-day workshop called Of This Land, a convening on living land acknowledgements in Brooklyn. The program included Lenape representatives from four of the five federally recognized tribes and the Lenape Center, along with staff from eight Brooklyn cultural institutions. The goal of the convening was to discuss how Brooklyn institutions can implement living or ongoing land acknowledgement projects that are appropriate and respectful to Lenape Delaware nations. The key takeaway from the convening was the need for education about the history of violent displacement, the ongoing erasure of Lenape people from their ancestral homelands, and the resilience of Lenape communities today. Next slide, please. Then, growing out of recent calls for racial justice and discussions at, discussions at the museum or conversations at the museum on how we could respond, we committed to reinstalling our American art galleries. In under six months, opening in December 2020, we partially reinstalled the first two galleries to address differing visions of land, abolition, labor, and identity in the United States. We also installed Welcome to Lenape Hoking at the entrance to the galleries in order to put Lenape voices first in the museum's American wing and respond to the representative's call for broader public education. 
the two objects on display, an early 19th century Delaware bowl and Edward Hicks 1833 painting, The Peaceable Kingdom, present different perspectives about Lenape history. The delicately carved wooden bowl adorned with two human faces in relief reflects the refined Delaware aesthetic and may have traveled to Fort Snelling, Minnesota in the 1830s with Lenape refugees fleeing north to Wisconsin or Ontario, Canada. The painting by Edward Hicks, on the other hand, depicts a scene of Eden Edenic harmony, including a vignette of William Penn's treaty with the Lenape. Hicks' fictional portrayal idealizes the encounter between British colonists and indigenous people, eliding the fact that the Lenape were ultimately forced out of Pennsylvania owing to fraudulent land deals perpetrated by Penn's sons. The Brooklyn Museum continues to develop educational programs with Lenape representatives, such as a teaching workshop for New York City educators, co-organized with and hosted by the Brooklyn Public Library. During the workshop, speakers from the Lenape Center and Three Nations spoke directly to educators about Lenape culture and history and proposed teaching topics. In keeping with the museum's vision statement, where great art and courageous conversations are catalysts for a more connected, civic, and empathetic world, collections are used in both exhibitions to connect with visitors and confront critical and timely social justice issues. Ongoing evaluation, community engagement, and internal reflection in the planning of the American Art Gallery reinstallation are critical to success, especially when responding to calls for action. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, and especially um, highlighting the role museums play in educating the public, but also their part in um, putting forward social justice and the issues that are relevant with indigenous people and environment. Um, I would like to now uh, invite Sarah Suzuki, Associate Director, Museum of Modern Art, New York, for the next presentation. Thanks very much, Viba, and a thanks to Michelle and the team at Asia Society for putting together this uh, really tremendous convening. It's my pleasure uh, also to be here with Nancy and Viva and Hor, um, who are always great partners in conversation and so inspiring in the work that they do. So I'm happy to talk a little bit this morning about uh, a project that's currently underway at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. MoMA reopened and expanded campus in the fall of 2019 following a short closure to complete um, a renovation and expansion project. And when we reopened, it really marked an important moment for us. It manifested a new ambition for our collection galleries in particular. That was one that reflected over a decade of expanded thinking of related work and acquisitions. It had been shaped very much by a new generation of curatorial leadership and curatorial thinking. By the decade long influence of our CMAP research groups, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that if people are interested, um, as well as the network of scholars and institutions and artists that those that, that research had brought us into contact with and had helped us connect with, as well as a recognition that the stories are modern and contemporary art are much more polyphonic and multivalent than could be understood from the traditional path uh, through MoMA's galleries. So we and, and many others have typically shorthanded the work that we do in collection galleries as permanent collection galleries, meaning of course that the works that are on view are drawn from our institutional holdings. But I think beyond that, the designation signaled to many that those installations were themselves somehow permanent, static, ossified, unchanging. And so our gambit with the reopening was to shift to a set of dynamic collection galleries. They're spaces that are evolving on an ambitious timeline. They offer the opportunity for more speculative installations and um, propositions, the opportunity to shift from the ism, which had really often led um, that path through those spaces, sh shift from the ism to the idea 
for a greater number of curatorial voices and perspectives to be shared um, and, and have those spaces be authored rather than by a kind of unnamed institutional voice and for the, a greater and more diverse cohort of artists to be on view on our walls and in conversation with us in all of the contextual and content material that we produce. So I thought this morning I'd walk you through three galleries that are currently on view just to highlight some of the dis different tactics and approaches that we are experimenting with. I'd like to underscore that this is and hopefully will remain a work in progress. I am not suggesting this morning in any way that this is somehow the way to do it uh, or that this isn't already happening in other institutions or collection projects, but just wanted to share some of the approaches that are new to us and that we're pursuing into the future. Uh, Vanessa, if I could have the next slide, please. And the next one, thanks. So our collection display at the Museum of Modern Art unfolds across 62 galleries that span three floors. And we, re we introduced a lot of variables in 2019, a new um, approach to interdisciplinarity, again, a kind of a release of the kind of ism-driven march through uh, chronology that had been there previously, the introduction of many new voices, which necessarily shifted out of our spaces, many of those kind of old favorites that people often expected to see when they came in. So we did keep a constant in place and that constant was chronology. So the galleries still unfold in a roughly chronological order, starting with early modern on the fifth floor. And traditionally as a visitor would enter that first gallery, they were very frequently met with Paul Cezanne's bather on a central freestanding wall. And that's a kind of classic figurative picture, hands on the hips, partially clad, he seems to step towards us. Central position in the room was unavoidable. Um, the, the reopening installation of which you see two images here, um, this, this gallery was given the title 19th Century Innovators. It privileged interdisciplinarity and brought works from across MoMA's departmental collections together in a new form of cross curatorial collaboration. These works had formerly been parsed into departmental galleries. So you might've seen photography on the third floor, you might've seen drawings on the second floor and so on. So bringing these mediums together in an intentional and really kind of holistic way really marked a new approach for us. But as you can see with that freestanding wall now gone, the bather kind of decentralized, what we have instead of in the middle of the gallery are um, ceramics by George Orr who the self-titled Mad Potter of Biloxi. Um, so we really decentering painting here, decentering Cezanne, and introducing instead what maybe would have been considered in a, in a previous generation, a kind of craft medium. You see on the left woodcuts by the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch, one of those figures that often seems to elude many of the tidy categories of the period on the left. Van Gogh's Starry Night, again, another popular candidate for that former central wall here in the rear left corner next to Henri Rousseau's Sleeping Gypsy. Um, Cezanne does appear here. You see him in the slide on the right to the left of the doorway. It's Boy in the Red Vest and flanking the other side, several incredible and very tender aquatints by Mary Cassatt. I think part of what was incredibly interesting about this space as well is what you see through the doorway. And that's a glimpse of moving image that was footage shot from a moving train as it as it travels through um, Grand Central, the Grand Central route into Grand Central Terminus. Um, but it moves lens-based work right to the front of the story of modernism, rather than parsing it out into a separate space or suggesting that it isn't a coherent part or you know a really catalytic part of that history. Uh, next slide, please, Vanessa. Just about three weeks ago, we reinstalled this gallery completely. The new uh, title of the space is Motion and Illumination, and it looks at two of the technological innovations, the railway and the electric light that ushered in the modern age for better or worse. Um, the gallery now positions film and photography, not in the second gallery even, but in the very first. Um, and you see uh, in the slide on the left, that's in fact a hanging screen 
which shows incredible footage taken in 1902 of the Wuppertal Elevated Railway. And it was shot on a 65 millimeter negative, which means that it holds so much information that when we see it today, someone said to me, this looks like it was shot in 4K. It's absolutely amazing, but it's completely of the period, though a digital restoration and transfer. Um, so really highlights film and photography, and you see in the middle where previously George Orr had more or less been a selection of Tiffany lamps, as well as monotypes by Degas, photographs by Brassai, and more. So here, I think a suggestion of really how we, we hope to change these spaces over time to signal that there is no one starting point, there is no one way for us to be thinking about how our collection and our stories begin, that there is no one narrative, but in fact, myriad and multiple that we look forward to exploring. Uh, next slide, please, Vanessa. On the fourth floor, which roughly covers uh, the period from the 40s through the 70s, a favorite work, which is Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series, now anchors Gallery 403. And it's the fulcrum around which the works in this space, the galleries titled In and Around Harlem, kind of um, orbit and coalesce. If you'd seen Lawrence's um, migration series in the collection galleries previously, you might've seen it in isolation. It was often installed by itself, not necessarily part of a larger gallery or a larger narrative. Here, Lawrence is surrounded by others who were part of the, his artistic community or who likewise took inspiration from the neighborhood and its residents. Uh, on the top right, Romare Bearden. Uh, to the right in that image, a film by Bernice Abbott. Uh, on the bottom, Alice Neal, William H. Johnson. So I think a space in which we're, we're refocusing attention on pictures that we maybe had struggled to contextualize before, thinking more deeply about different lenses through which to think about them, and also thinking very seriously in the last decade plus about acquisitions that would really help us to tell deeper and broader stories. The William H. Johnson, for example, is relatively new to the collection. Uh, last slide, please, Vanessa. So another of the new experiments that we're positing is to try to develop a chronology for our contemporary galleries on the second Floor. While chronology had been a guiding principle for early modern and mid-century, we hadn't thought about contemporary, our contemporary collection in the same way previously. So kudos to my curatorial colleagues who have really been thinking about how to create the same kind of chronological sequencing in these spaces um, as we have upstairs. The gallery that you see here, 215, comes towards the end of the loop, which means that it is among the most recently made works, the most contemporary works uh, that we have on view in the museum. And it opened with an installation called Worlds to Come. Um, and that featured, among others, a monumental drawing by Kara Walker, which is not visible here, a massive mosaic by Jack Whitten in homage to Edouard Glissant, which is visible on the top left, on the left side, a Neri Bagramian sculpture, which is here in the middle, as the Walker drawing necessitated a stewardship change, one of the challenges about uh, collection galleries is that when you integrate works on paper and photography, we often try to keep those works on view only for six months in order to preserve their um, overall longevity and give us opportunities to install them in the future. But it means it gives us the opportunity to create new dialogues and relationships. So when the Carol Walker moved back to storage, um, a series of Edgar Heap of Birds monotypes uh, were introduced. And then this space was fully reinstalled just last month um, with the new title, Unstable Ground. And in the two images on the right side, you see Terry Adkins um, sculpture in the foreground. In the back, two works by the Indian artist Shambhavi, a work on paper that was acquired about 12 years ago, and a sculpture that was acquired, I think, just last year. So also a nod to how I think our collecting practices are shifting to allow us to tell these kinds of stories in the gallery. And just on the bottom, another recent acquisition by Marwan Rahmawi. So these strategies that we're, we're 
experimenting with now about a different kind of interdisciplinarity for us as an institution. Of course, this is happening in many places and, and has been, but for us, it's a different kind of experiment. Really delving into kind of change over time, introducing other artists to our mix, being less attached to our traditional story of isms and those artists that often led them. Um, and with that, I would like to just uh, issue an invitation to all of you. I look forward to inviting you to the Museum of Modern Art to um, experience these collection galleries and to share back with us uh, your, your uh, perspective on, on how you think this new approach is working or not. And I thank, I thank you all for your attention this morning. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you all the three speakers. Um, it was very interesting to see that uh, you all had different focuses, but at the same time, you're talking about new acquisitions, new ways of exhibiting old uh, collections. And um, just to get the production team and the audience ready, uh, now we will move on to discussion. Uh, I would be moderating the first 40 minutes of discussion and which would be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A by the audience. And I would encourage the audience to write their questions in the Q&A so that we can get it on the rendezvous platform. Thank you. I, um, I would like to, I mean, these questions are addressed to all of you. Their presentations are very different, but I would like to sort of um, address some kind of general issues as well when it comes to museums and collecting and also collaborating on certain exhibitions. So if I start with collaboration, and I know that um, in your separate roles as curators, you all have collaborated on different exhibitions and your exhibitions have also traveled. And I would like to sort of what um, include the presentation as well as your previous work, which you have not been able to talk about, uh, so that you get a chance to also tell us about your collaborative ventures with um, artists and indigenous people. So um, as the theme is post-colonial, so I will come to that, that while the focus is on the post-colonial world, the tension seems to be between how to examine the possible virtues of collaboration, while at the same time avoiding the possibility of this becoming appropriation. So what we mean by collaboration? And this is something I would like you to think about. Um, and how do we avoid it becoming paternalistic and self-serving on behalf of the dominant partners in the collaborations? This is a theme which was also touched upon yesterday in one of the panels, that uh, there is a dominance uh, from the curator who's coming from a certain standpoint and the people and the artists that you're collaborating with. So how do we reconcile this? And the question is open to all three of you. And I would uh, start with Hur and then Nancy, then Sarah, for you to consider and answer. Thank you, Viva. Um, of course, I always go back to biennials. I've been working in biennials for 20 years um, and collaborated with many curators, um, as well as my colleagues here. We, everything we do is a collaboration, but I think it's always important to um, listen and, and give and take. So when I was invited to curate the Lahore Biennial, for example, um, I didn't want to assume that um, what happens a lot of times in the West that people assume that us in the other parts of the world um, don't have the facilities or knowledge or know-how until they come and realize actually, you know, we have one of the best technical team and we're very professional and have good attention to detail. So when I went to Lahore Biennial, I did not also want to assume that. I wanted to work with the team and if I could contribute in any way, um, in the end, I had two of our technical team come and work with the team there to help. But at the same time, I think that's what collaboration is about. Um, we have collaborated, for example, um, with Homeworks in uh, Beirut, Ashkal Alwan, where one of our technical team went and helped also with installations there. Um, we've shared projectors and um, 
knowledge as well with, with again technical team uh, uh, to for example Dhaka Art Summit we lent some projectors um, so I think sharing is is really important because especially with like for us we've been doing biennials for 20 years but there are a lot of new biennials that are coming up and I think there used to be this feeling of uh, museums and biennials competing but more and more so now everybody wants to work together uh, to you know to help artists produce the best works together rather than um, expect the artist to do something new for them and then new something for the next biennial and the next biennial so uh, I think yeah I don't know if that kind of answers your question a little bit but from my point of view that's what I would say um, Nancy Yeah, uh, you have I think, collaborated. I mean, my approach to my curatorial practice. Yes, yes, and and collaboration. I mean, and I think primarily it's being a humble curator, um, and that's very much a part of my practice. And collaboration not only involves um, with collaborating with the native people that I've worked with um, on collection-based projects or special exhibitions, but then also working with colleagues within the institution and doing cross collection collaborations as well. So, um, I mean, that's, that's basically the approach that I've taken with my work at the museum. Um, I would also like you to sort of, um, elaborate a little less to, uh, the themes that you choose of climate change and also the land acquisition, how much of it was actually pushed by the community itself? Because, you know, what is the the political uh, environment at present? And I am sort of asking you this because I remember walking down the botanical gardens and there was a plaque about saying the botanical garden and this area was Lenape people and how you're trying to, how they're trying to bring back even the biodiversity that existed at that point of time before the land was acquired and it was used for something totally different. So how much is the community also pushing yeah. it? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the, the, what was the beauty of the convening and including eight Brooklyn cultural institutions was to develop those relationships, um, cross institutional relationships. So the garden representatives from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden actually came um, to our convening. And so, um, and so in that case, and then having the Lenape representatives who attended direct or indicate what they wanted institutions to do. So, um, so that very much informed our approach. It informed the exhibition, Welcome to Lenape Hoking. Originally, it was just going to be inserted into the galleries. And then in the summer of 2020, with all the protests and everything, we decided to shift it to a more visible um, location. Um, so, so again, this responsiveness of the museum to the times that were occurring, and then also listening to what Lenape Delaware representatives were telling us was very important. And it's been, it was important to actually hear the conversations directly um, and not serve as um, interlocutors between Native people um, um, and our audiences. We very much wanted Native people to speak directly. Um, so um, that's about the Lenape, the land acknowledgement and, and how we approached it. Um, and I think, I think that having the convening was important in that way because it was an opportunity when we brought in these representatives from four of the five federally recognized tribes, they had not been together in a very long time in one place. And many, they came from Ontario, from Canada, they came from Wisconsin, they came from Oklahoma. I mean, and this was a return home to them to come to New York City and meet and spend time together. And so providing those opportunities as well is very important. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> It elaborates, it sort of gives a more idea as to what is happening in the background, you know, something that goes beyond the exhibition with the people. And Sarah, um, 
I know I'm also kind of looking at, you know, what kind of um, uh, when the museum was revamped and uh, the first exhibition that was put was Bodhi's exhibition, which you had uh, curated. So I was wondering whether you could also bring in some of that experience into um, the collaboration in the sense that you are talking about post-colonial world and you're looking at world art and how you bring it in into the museum. Viva, I think you're you're speaking to the BOTUS Isaac Kingles exhibition, um, which I had the pleasure of organizing in 2018. So it was actually just before our brief closure and reopening. But I, I think it is in that moment, it is is nonetheless um, an example of, of the same of a similar kind of dynamic and, and um, following on what I think both Hor and Nancy are suggesting, um, but speaking from a position where realistically, I think um, a, a large scale institution like ours may very um, likely have to be really cognizant and aware of uh, relationship dynamics and really ensure that we are prioritizing a relationship that's one about reciprocity and exchange. It's it's perhaps particularly easy from the vantage point of New York to be able to um, absorb the incredible work and scholarship that's happening around the world and, and bring it into our walls. But I think um, essentially important to make sure that we're recognizing that work and those scholars. I think one of the places we've done it quite um, productively over the years is through the CMAP research programs that I mentioned a few moments ago, those are in, I believe, their 11th year. And they started as internal research groups that had um, geographic or thematic focuses and were really an attempt to um, engage in internal research for a durational period. Um, and when each began, I was one of the, the founding members of what was performativity in East Asia. Um, they began with no end date, prescribed end date, and they began with no um, prescribed outcomes. So no sense that the research on performativity in East Asia would lead to exhibition, catalog, acquisition, panel discussion, but rather an, a, an opportunity to really dig into the topic and to try to connect with um, curators, scholars, artists around the region who had been particularly focused on this and um, find ways to really engage in durational dialogues over time uh, while hopefully offering them access to the resources that we have at the museum to further their own research and scholarship. Maybe that was, you know, coming to New York to give a talk and then being able to kind of continue one's research in the city. But I think over the years, we've built some really um, wonderful networks in that way. But I think being attentive, again, to those ideas of reciprocity and exchange um, it, it is, is critically important. And I think that's, that's how collaboration may best move forward in this moment. Thank you. Um, I also, uh, what has come up as a kind of common theme is also uh, delving into the existing collections. And so I, my next question is um, about reinterpreting the existing collection. So how does one decide which items to select from the already existing collections? And how do you reinterpret collections that have not been built or assembled in the light of the contemporary issues, such as climate change, decolonization, migration, globalization, refugee crisis, and currently Black Lives Matter? So who? Well, um, a lot of our collection comes out of the biennial primarily, but then we've continued to collect as I've um, followed some works uh, by artists or seen works that are really um, important um, in the dialogue, like you say, in current situations. Uh, we do try to collect a more um, focused uh, regionally. And when I say regional, I'm being very broad because, you know, we're in a, our, our uh, location it kind of connects to many uh, diasporas and, uh, and uh, spaces. So I think for us, it's uh, by looking at the 
what some people would call the global south is very important for us, the south-south conversation. Um, and we haven't, um, we didn't start, at, the collection kind of came out organically through everything that we're doing, hence us building a space for the collection uh, after the fact or during, because we realized we need a space um, all year round for this collection. Um, but we have been lending uh, to many institutions uh, what's been great is that we've helped a lot of artists or estates, families um, uh, look after the, the work and get it shown and seen. Um, and I think that that's very important for us when we did, for example, the show on um, uh, the um, Sudanese modernism that I co-curated with my colleague Salah Hassan, director of the Africa Institute in Sharjah, or the Egyptian surrealism. We worked very closely with the families as well. I think uh, for, um, oh, yeah, Nancy. Can I, can I go ahead? Um, yes, sure. so, so for climate and crisis, it was a combination of, of collections because there was, it was a very collapsed time frame to organize this. So it was looking at collections that were already on view and seeing from particular regions of the world and seeing what were the issues there. So for, for Northwest Coast material, looking at what was going on in the Northwestern part of the United States, the Arctic region, um, the new objects that we put out related to the Amazon region in Brazil and the fire. So that was an opportunity to go into storage and look at Amazonian material we had um, and, and um, put those objects out on view. Um, regarding the experimentation that we've been doing in the American art galleries, in the past, we've just had a gallery devoted to American landscape painting. Um, and so what we decided to do this time was to pair a landscape painting with a painted hide by Kotsiogo, a Shoshone artist who created a Alkai painting in 1900 that depicts Shoshone, his Shoshone tribe on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. And in this, in this painted hide, you see women um, butchering buffalo, um, you see dancers, you see people, um, native um, Shoshone people coming back from a buffalo hunt. Um, and that's paired with William Keith's Mount Hood painting. Um, and then what we do is we talk about um, the fact that this painting was commissioned by the railroad, um, that William Keith had been commissioned to do these works as a form of advertising um, for the expansion of the railroad. And, and then talking about the, the place names, Mount Hood was named after a naval captain who had never visited the region, a British naval captain. And so talking about naming and um, we present the Mahola name for Mount Hood in the gallery. So just talking about shifting um, what is being presented and how um, these different genres um, are being presented and how they, by pairing them and having them in conversation, you can bring out new topics for visitors. Thank you. Sarah, you have been involved in redoing the whole thing. <laughs> You have talked about it, but now tell us, how do you select? Thank you, Viva. This, yeah. is a, this is a great question. And so MoMA's collection is about 200,000 objects uh, across six departments. And, um, you know, a, a small percentage of those are on view at any given time. I think what's been really wonderful about the new way that we're working is that it really um, centers around an internal collaboration first. So each of the, the collection floors that I briefly discussed today has a, an internal working group that's made up of curators, conservators, um, colleagues from archives, library, and research collections, our content team, and they get together on a biweekly basis to really think about topics for those floors um, and brainstorm together about different ways to approach themes and motifs, artists 
um, geographic locations that may be interesting focuses going forward. And then the, the reality is there are such diverse perspectives, curatorial perspectives within the institution that each of us brings our own um, deep passions and interests in addition to a kind of broad knowledge about the collection as a whole. And that allows us to be engaged in what is really a kind of constant process of re-looking and reimagining. So as one is thinking about these gallery spaces, one is, is kind of constantly going through our collection management system and, and constantly kind of coming across objects that we you've maybe seen many times or maybe have never seen in person and realize like, oh, there, there's a, a conversation that we're having in that working group where this work could make a major contribution. Um, you know, I think about a couple of examples in, in on the fourth floor right now, we have a beautiful Guy Tonde painting. That painting was acquired in 1963, the year after the work was made in 1962. It was on view in 1964, and I'm not sure it has been on view since. But in a gallery that's devoted not to abstract expressionism, capital A, capital E, but rather the theme planes of color, where you may be looking at the work of uh, Nevelson, Newman, Rothko, and Guy Tonde, you're able to kind of think of a different uh, constellation in which to make that connection. Um, so I think it, it's a constant process of re-looking and re re-looking at and reimagining what's in this very vast um, and broad collection that we have, and um, asking ourselves again and again about the different stories that the works can can help us put forward. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, now, uh, I know that museums um, also acquire new collections, new acquisitions, and um, who has been acquiring a lot of new collections, but about even um, sort of Brooklyn Museum and MoMA would be collecting. And I just wanted to know something. I, it may sound a little naive, the way I put it, but at the same time, there is certain thing about art and especially global art. And now that we are becoming very inclusive in museums and collections from um, global perspective, I wanted to ask you that, uh, what are the criteria of acceptable acquisition? Is it a search for some kind of, some idea of authenticity? Does it in fact, or does in fact authenticity become a search for the pure and the pristine? And if so, does that detract from the search for the history and context of production? Or can these two aims be reconciled? Now I'm thinking in the terms of artists who are trained in a certain formal tradition. And uh, Parul had also brought it out yesterday that how the formalism in art has uh, been imbibed and the artist from the global, whether you call it South, North um, and colonial and post-colonial worlds, how the artists are framing their art, how they are thinking about it and what they are producing. And when the curators go to acquire something new, what are the criteria? What is your criteria? What you are, what you are looking in, in a new acquisition? It may be, yeah, it's not a trick question. <laughs> so I, I think, just, yeah. Yeah, I think for us, talking about collection or just exhibition making, uh, it's important for us to, um, in our part of the world, write our own histories. For the longest time, it's always been the white man writing his story. And um, that that is the importance of an institution in our part of the world, that we are um, going through as I said, working with artists and their families, estates, to create work that talks to our language, history, location, um, suffering, etc. cetera. Um, and I think when you ask that question, you're asking very different institutions in very different parts of the world. Uh, so the answer is not, is not going to be the same. But for us, this is something that we've been struggling for the longest period of time with. Um, I say it when I uh, look at certain artists, for example, Wa'al Shauki's work um, 
cabaret crusades, you know, using Amin Malouf's book, looking at the crusades through the Arab eyes. Um, a personal connection, my father writing a book about the British, many books about British occupation here in, in Sharjah and the UAE, uh, where, you know, our family were called pirates by the British so they can gain control of the coast. But actually our story is that it was a colonial uh, project. So, you know, these stories are really important for us to tell. Otherwise, our histories get lost or they get rewritten. Yeah, Nancy. Um, for the for the Brooklyn Museum um, acquisitions, and this is something that we've been working on in as we're slowly developing a strategic plan for collecting. But basically, um, there are three main criteria. One is that the work um, sort of coincides with the museum's mission statement, um, which is, and I just, I brought it up now, to create inspiring encounters with art that expand the way we see ourselves, the world and its possibilities. And of course, this is a very broad mission statement, but, but part of that is also looking at what kind of stories does the object tell, um, um, which is, which is very important. And then is this a work that you're gonna put on exhibition right away? So I think that those, those criteria, those are the three main criteria for acquisitions. Um, we've also been looking at um, maybe focused acquisitions that tie into climate change, um, uh, which would be more of a short term, you know, over several years, that there would be um, a focus on acquisitions like that. Um, and I know that the show, I was able to acquire Gail Tremblay's basket for the exhibition because of that focused um, theme. So that's how we're, that's how we're doing things in Brooklyn at the moment. Uh, Sarah? Thanks. Um, I think, you know, first it has to be a compelling work of art, I would say. Um, and then I think, you know, MoMA is not an encyclopedic museum. So necessarily thinking about how we might be positioned to best show that work, share it with a public, how might we be able to contextualize it, how, what stories might it be able to tell for our audiences. Um, I'm thinking of a, of a recent acquisition by the, uh, by Malin Gatna, a, a painter, a Mozambican painter, um, a work that was recently acquired and installed right away because there was a gallery on the fourth floor called War Within, War Without. And it really looked at, it was kind of a global take on uh, social and political turmoil in the 1970s from, from Vietnam to Chile to Sudan to what was happening here in the United States. And it, it just kind of so wonderfully offered another, not wonderfully because it's a very tough picture, but you know, it offered such a cogent and compelling take on the work that was in that space of Benny Andrews and Tetsumi Kudo. And so to be able to kind of layer in another perspective, that's where we know, you know, that 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 we can do right by that object and not acquire it for the sake of acquiring it, but acquiring it to put it on view, to share it with audiences and to let it tell some of its, of its stories. So I think that's very much where um, some of the thinking is on that right now. Thank you. Um, I was also thinking about, um, do you also invite um, guest curators? And I'm thinking that there's, since it's about post-colonial, um, the, the panel is considering the museum collection in post-colonial world, would you, um, is there also a move to invite curators from different parts of the world to come in and curate an exhibition? And if so, what what does it entail in the museum? So for, uh, for a museum like MoMA or Brooklyn Museum and um, uh, the Sharjah Art Foundation, would you, when you collaborate or when you say that, okay, we would like to bring in something, some aspect from the global South or from the Americas, and we would like to give it, 
give the person a free reign? Does that happen? I mean, does a guest curator get a free reign or do they have to work within certain parameters? I know there are kind of um, about free speech is different because free speech also has parameters, constitutional parameters and legal parameters. Uh, but when and, and how much time would it take in the future for museums to actually ask a guest curator to come and say that, OK, this is our collection and you propose a theme and we would let you put it up? Does that happen? Or do you see that happening in the future? Um, who? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are parameters, of course. There's budget, there's, you know, logistics, there's like a million parameters. And with each institution, there's rules and regulations. There's health and safety, et cetera. And then, you know, it's, there's also our team to consider. Sometimes a curator might want to, you know, uh, push people to work extra long hours. But as a director of a foundation, I have to look after my team and make sure that they're not overworked and that they're also you know safe etc so of course there are uh, many um, you know restrictions but we work with the guest curators for biennials uh, the two exhibitions i mentioned that we have on at the moment um her Sar sarkisian is curated by our our uh, my colleague who works with us at Sharjah, director of collections and senior curator omar khalay but it's in collaboration with the Bonifantin Museum and Bonnier's Kunstal. So we work together, three institutions, to curate this show that will travel. The uh, other exhibition that Annie Fletcher curated uh, at Van Abbe is, again, um, an exhibition that uh, we worked with her on, and it will continue to tour to, to IMA. Um, but with the Autolith Group exhibition, uh, we managed to show the work in a different way because we have uh, different possibilities. We have outdoor courtyards where we're able to screen some films. We have uh, beautiful alleyways that you walk into to discover works. So there are um, there are ways for uh, curators to think creatively, but I, I can't say that there are no restrictions because that's not a reality. Yeah, Nancy. Um, so, um, in in the projects that I've worked on at Brooklyn, um, the role of Native people in participating in our projects has definitely shifted. So, for example, in 2011, when I organized TP Heritage of the Great Plains, we had um, several um, Plains tribe people, whether they're artists or elders or historians working on the project um, as consultants, um, but I'm now working on a project um, with the Hopi tribe in Arizona based upon the museum's um, Kachina dog collection, um, and their role is as consultant curators. So we've, we've sort of adjusted the role to be more of a co-curatorial role with, with my role being more of a um, facilitator of those conversations. This project, it was put on hold because of COVID, um, but it just started. I went to Arizona in October, um, met with the um, members, Hopi elders on the cultural resources advisory task team um, who approved the project. And now we're moving forward in scheduling planning meetings in New York and then back at Hopi. So, um, and there are two Hopi consultant curators on that project, um, as well as a coordinator at Hopi. And then um, we're providing funding for a Hopi student intern to work with that, to work with that um, coordinator. So, and, and these are paid, these are honoraria, these are paid positions. So we're beginning to shift that and provide to recognize the important role that Native people have in the development of exhibitions. Um, and so it'll, I'm excited to see how that project plays out um, in the coming year. Thank you. Sarah? Thanks for this. Is, it, it's a great question. And I think there are so many different forms of curatorial collaboration. So the, but I, I have to, of course, agree with Hor. There, there is no life without parameters. I mean, it, 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 
which can be in their own way very useful. Um, I think where we've given the, the freest reign is to artists. We have a longstanding series called Artist Choice that invites artists to come in and essentially, you know, dig through the collection, remix it how they would like to, and, um, you know, share, share their own take on um, some of the works from the collection with, with audiences. In 2019, Amy Silman did a, an absolutely gorgeous installation called The Shape of Shape. And we have right now a beautiful installation by the artist Ito Barada called A Raft that will be on for a while longer if, if people are able to see it. And it, it really gives a completely different perspective than our internal curatorial one. Um, there are also certainly um, kind of curator curator collaborations. I'm thinking about Mabel Wilson, who was the co-curator of our reconstruction show with Sean Anderson last year. Time is, time is amorphous. Um, or Anoma Pires, who's working with Martino Steirla on um, the project of independence, was a, which is an exhibition about modern architecture in South Asia, um, which is coming next year. Um, I think the, the other thing is, is really to invite people to work with us in a way that keeps us from hopefully becoming too insular and always invites outside perspectives to point out the things that we may have stopped seeing ourselves to, um, to challenge the internal thinking, which, you know, always runs the risk of becoming, as I said, kind of insular and isolated. Um, so some new, some new efforts on the way to ensure that that happens as well. Can I also add and, and thank that's, you, that's um, Sarah, for yeah. talking about contemporary artists because, because we're very, I mean, this is something that we do and it's not necessarily in my, um, in my wheelhouse, but um, Guadalupe Maravilla, who has a piece now at MoMA, um, is going to have a show at Brooklyn in April. And he just came, I worked with him in the collections, and he selected about 20 ancient Maya pieces for inclusion is, in his exhibition. So, so again, this is an example of artists mining the collections to include um, collection objects in their exhibition and, and working with contemporary artists. And, and that's something, it just, I do it automatically and it happens, so it never comes to um, mine, but I did, it was a visit that we had quite recently, two weeks ago, um, and working with it was just amazing, the collections. Thank you all, that was wonderful. Now we have, now we are going to open the floor for Q&A from the audience. We have one question already here. It's addressed um, to Sarah. Uh, did the shift to a more active and large scale rotation schedule at MoMA necessitate an increase in collections, preparation, labor forces? I think this can be addressed to all of you <laughs> for your various um, exhibitions and changes. First of all, thank you for the question. Um, the, the, the program of rotation that we have put forth is really ambitious. And what I will say is the museum reopened in October of 2019 on the expanded campus, October 21st, in fact, and closed on March 13th for COVID. Um, so there is a piece of this equation that's still about trying to create muscle memory for what we are trying to do here and really figure out what the needs of it will be. Part of this has been kind of turning the dials a little bit to understand where we can make other adjustments. So for example, we used to do collection installations that were department specific, as I mentioned before, in photography, on three, in drawings and prints. And so what does it mean when the, the, the work that used to go into making those uh, rotations happen actually gets absorbed into this larger cross-departmental project? The other thing is because of COVID, we've dialed down a little bit what's happening in our temporary exhibition spaces. But this is also a really interesting thing that I don't think we'll have time to talk about today. But I will say for a collecting institution um, like MoMA, historically, there's so much energy and attention that goes into temporary exhibitions. 
and they are a terrific draw for audiences. They're an incredible opportunity for curators to engage in new scholarship. But the reality is that when that show comes to a conclusion three months later, four months later, much of that scholarship kind of goes back out into the world. Most of those works were probably not from the collection. They were, they were put together, they were loans. Um, and so this new model in theory allows us to devote a lot of that intellectual energy to the collection. And you know, it's, there, it's mechanical energy too. I'm thinking about conservation treatments that would maybe happen for collection works rather than things that were coming in for temporary exhibition. And the opportunity for that deep thinking and research to continue to live on within the institution to build our knowledge of these objects and the um, multivalent ways that we can think about them rather than being the more the temporary exhibition model where something may come in for four months and then it goes back uh, it goes back from whence it came so I think still a lot to figure out with how we make this sustainable in the long term but that's really the goal and as I said lots of um, lots of different dials that we can turn in order to make that feasible. I think I would add that there's definitely a lot of labor that's sort of put in to, um, and, and, and light sensitive rotations have always been a part of what we do at Brooklyn. Um, but I think when, um, when you're doing contemporary art projects and shows that are coming in and artists go in um, to work with the collection that does put um, more work on the conservation department to review objects that may not have been on view before. Um, so you're balancing for these projects, you're balancing the work of multiple departments um, and hopefully not stressing too many people out um, in the process. Nancy, I just wanted to, to, to plus one that because I know I've talked today about curatorial a fair amount, but just to say that everything that we undertake at the museum is the result of efforts of hundreds of people. And that's everyone from our operations and engineering team to our frame shop, our preparators, our conservators, our educators, our editors, the list really goes on and on. So just to say, I, you know, we've I've been a little bit shorthanding today, but to Nancy's point, the, every one of these activities is a huge institutional effort. Um, so, uh, I yeah, I would um, I would like to say who has already pointed out the technical aspects and technicians and all kind of things that are part of the biennial and exhibitions that are taken. But uh, I've got just two questions that have just come in and we have um, we don't have that much time. So I would like to take those questions. Um, they're open questions for all of you. Uh, the first one, I will read out both together. I think that's much better because you might want to uh, answer only one of them, you know. So um, depending on um, who's answering. Uh, what infrastructure, either specific to museums, um, so, oh my goodness, there's suddenly all these questions are streaming in, sorry. What infrastructure either specific to museums or as industry-wide coordination that could help institutions' operational structures better align with the politics of artworks they display? That's one question. The second question is, when you open doors for curators to come in and collaborate, how inclusive this process is and if you can share a few processes that you follow to connect, collaborate with curators from other areas. We covered part of it in one of the questions earlier. And third is, um, what two or three things would help you with your work? We have about 10 minutes, uh, about eight minutes to answer these three questions. Some points have already already been covered by you in answering other questions, but um, I will give, give you the freedom to answer which one of them you feel is more relevant or you feel like answering. So start with Hoor. Well, uh, okay, let me see. Um, when you open doors to curators, I guess, it's, I could talk about the biennial. I think um, 
for us, um, location is very important. So um, when curators come from the outside, uh, we have to also work closely with them to um, work for them to understand our context and see and research. Uh, for example, when Unjiju curated the 12th Biennial, uh, you know, I took her to all the archaeological sites that really um, were an important factor actually at the end for her project. And a lot of artists ended up going and doing things around the archaeological sites. So I think this, and also artists, when they come, we have kind of like a research package of what they can see. Um, we're a bit uh, luckier than a um, museum in New York City because the city is our space <laughs> and we can pop up and work with different spaces and communities. Um, and we have spaces actually in each town and village that in Sharjah, uh, renovating old schools or you know old factories. So we have many audiences and communities. So I think our location is also quite different. Nancy? Um, well, I mean, looking at looking at collaboration on a more granular level, um, I would say that it involves everything from informing the checklist, the final checklist of an exhibition to vetting content, um, uh, making sure for Native American exhibitions, making sure that there are no sacred ceremonial objects that are included. When I talk about vetting checklists, that's very important. And it may involve consultation with other specialists to make sure that um, the objects included in a show are appropriate. Um, I, um, I'm trying to think of what else I was going to talk about um, with that. So, and then, and, um, and then in terms of um, artists and how involved they are in a project, it really depends upon the artist, um, him or herself, on, on what they want to do. But when I've worked um, on projects um, with artists, whether it's Cecilia Vicuña, who came in and did a quipu sculpture and worked with the pre-Columbian, the ancient textiles from Peru in our collection and selected them, and having that dialogue, it was very important that the that the text was vetted with her, um, and um, and then Jeffrey Gibson, who we did a show of his work um, at the museum, and then he worked with the American collections because he was looking at the representation of Native people by by non-Native and then Native artists. So there was a very strong incorporation of Native American objects in that show, as well as the inclusion of his work. So um, it really it really depends upon the situation um, and the type of show. And, um, and then for the Hopi Katsina show that's in process now, that will be very much guided by the consulting curators um, in terms of final checklist and content and um, what the themes are gonna be. Yes, Sarah. So picking up on something that that Hor was referring to, I think what's really um, what's really critical actually is a sense of of true hospitality. Um, and the the word in the question that I, I believe the word in the question is inclusive, and I think that's that's exactly right. The question is how can we really be generously hospitable so that someone feels like they're really part of our community in the time that they're with us. And I, I will just say, I think that um, that is something that, that we can continue to work on. There are always ways to, to think about how we ensure that an invited guest or collaborator feels the warmth of the welcome um, that we hope that they, that they feel and that we, have thought about ways and asked them about the ways that we can further their own research and interests, whether that's making connections for them or um, making our own collections available. Or I think hospitality is really key there. And I'm not sure that traditionally that has been a strength of institutions um, when it comes to inviting people into the walls. Um, and actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly 
address that last question because I think it touches here. I think one one thing, um, and it's it's easier said than done. One of the things that would help is time. You know, I think we are all. Um, each of us and every one of our colleagues at the places that we work feel the feel the pressure of time. There's always ambition to do uh, probably more than we reasonably can. There's always a desire to be additive, right? To, to, to take on a new project, but not necessarily let an old one go to make space for that. And I think likewise, as, as we try to be hospitable, very often what people feel is, is the pressure of the, uh, you know, of, of the work that's already on their plate and the things they have currently. So um, I, I ask the universe for more time, <laughs> if at all feasible. Thank you. I second that, Sarah. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for um, such lovely presentations and answering the questions so fully. And I would just like to, um, just before I hand over to Michelle, I would just like to say that uh, I know at one point or the other, some of you have been involved with uh, Envisor. And I would just like to evoke what he had put forward, saying that uh, the works, the artworks, uh, always reflect on the ways that colonialism continues to structure the world in which we are. And so though we talk about post-colonial, but col colonialism is something that is still there in the present politics. And also the thing about art history is global and art history is flexible and it's incomplete because we are making art history all the time and it is a continuous process. And when we see, the, see that how whose effort in Sharjah has now made Sharjah has become a global place, you know, it has become a center which was not there earlier. So you see that, you know, how the, the young art student goes back, takes up a challenge and brings in new ideas. Then we have Sarah's, uh, this whole idea of looking, reinterpreting the old collection in the post-colonial world, but also looking at different themes. And then we have Nancy working with climate change, with indigenous people, and again, you are looking at the collection, but also bringing in new collections and ideas and voices, the voices that are given space in the central thing. And that is something that I, I, I'm very glad that I had uh, was invited to moderate the session. I've learned a lot. Uh, and now I would like to um, actually hand over to Michelle Yoon. The session comes to completion. Uh, thank you all for listening and for presenting.